All right, welcome back to the storehouse of corpses. Father, the ones lying de- lying over there are Uncle Kraus, Uncle Rudolph, Aunt Kitty, and Aunt Rosa, and Godasan. Just those five, right? No. There are six people. <gasps> dun, dun, dun. There's one more person over there. Over here, rather. The body Hideyoshi was looking down on now happened to be hidden among the shadows in that mountain range of objects. Mountain range of objects is honestly the strangest expression I think I'm going to see today. In a blind spot to George, who stood by the entrance. So, George couldn't tell whose body it was. He can probably guess. So, George cursed himself. He cursed the fact that his worst guesses always turned out to be right. So, the one lying at your feet is Sh- Shannon, isn't it? And we have foggy glasses. Yes, it's Shannon Chan. No, he's crying. George fell completely silent. Aww. He shook lightly, his lower lip trembling. Normally, he would have wanted to run to his beloved's body, screaming and crying. However, before rashly rushing forward, he worked to keep his composure and asked his father. Is Shannon the same as Uncle Kraus and the others? <laughs> Hideyoshi deeply understood the meaning of those words. So he couldn't give George an immediate answer. Or rather, he felt that silence was the only sincere and loving response he could give George right now. When George asked if Shannon was the same, he meant to ask whether her corpse was in the same condition as the others or not. Since Hideyoshi hadn't denied it, it meant her corpse was in the same brutal state. Aww. Yeah, no, bro, no, don't do it. Can I look at Shannon? No, you can't. <laughs> yes, you tell him. Well, why? No, don't do it, bro. Why not? After all, I won't be able to see Shannon's face again, right? So why won't you let me see? You don't want to see that, trust me. What her face looked like at the end. No, no, don't do it. The last time you met Shannon-chan was yesterday, right? Yes. I see. When you left her, what kind of face was she showing you? It was a wonderful smile. After he handed her the ring, she hesitated, even though she must have already made up her mind. Then she looked bashful, and ran away because she was embarrassed to let him see her face looking like that. At least you still had a face then! That's the expression that was revived in George's mind. I see. Then I'm sure Shannon Chan would want to, would want to leave you with that smile in your memory. Ugh. Hideyoshi looked down upon Shannon's body lying at his feet. Just like the other bodies, it was in such a horrible state that it'd make anyone want to cover their eyes. Oh, no. Her head had been smashed in from the side, and no more than half of her expression remained. Oh, that, I don't need to know that. If the remaining blood-soaked half of her expression had been wiped clean, would that graceful smile of hers have peeked out? Oh, that's morbid. But only, uh, but only half of it. Okay, too much detail, no thank you. Without thinking, Hideyoshi slapped his hands over his eyes. How brutal. If her face was going to be crushed anyway, then if only all of it had been crushed. 
He might have been able to temporarily distract George from his pain by making the pathetic suggestion that it was someone else wearing Shannon's clothes. But half of her face had been left untouched. This music is making me sad. It caused the body so much humiliation while still proving beyond doubt that the body was Shannon's and no one else's. How inhuman. How brutish. <laughs> Meanwhile, Mr. Dead inside. And there, trying his best to burn the image of the remaining half of Shannon's expression into his eyes as she lay at Hideyoshi's feet, was Kanon. No. <laughs> Kanon was not crying, because Kanon did not have feelings. Tears had risen to his eyes, but they did not drip down. But that didn't mean he wasn't feeling as much sadness as everyone else. Losing Shannon, who had lived with him in the same orphanage, whom he had loved as a sister, must have been just the same as losing a blood relative. This music! George, I'm sure Shannon Chan is saying thank you. I don't think she's saying much right now. She must be glad you didn't end up seeing her in such a pitiful state. I'm sure she's thanking you for holding strong and showing restraint. No, I understand. I understand, father. I understand. George leaned against the outside wall of the storehouse, crouching down limply. Father, I have a request. What is it? No, oh, you gotta make me sad. I want you to look for me. Is there a ring on Shannon's finger? Oh no. A ring? Let me see. You don't need to know that, George. That's just going to make you even more sad. Hideyoshi crouched down. As he did, Kanon silently pointed to one of Shannon's hands. Yeah, there is. It's a diamond ring. With a valuable diamond. Must have been pretty expensive. And... Which hand? And which finger is it on? Hmm, the ring finger of her left hand. I see. So, Shannon Chan was engaged? <laughs> Eva's got so many things going through her mind right now. George, don't tell me you. Eva! That doesn't matter now. The woman's missing half her face. A man made a lifelong promise to Shannon Chan. A man promised her happiness for life. Who that man was isn't the issue here. Aww. He's a good daddy. Being told that by a man is a woman's dream, isn't it? I don't know when she received this ring. I also don't know who gave it to her. However, even so, Shannon Chan took this ring. Then she accepted it and put it on her left ring finger. I'm sure the man who gave it to her was also happy. To most of the people there, Hideyoshi was simply disturbed by this extraordinary situation and was blurting out nonsense. However, someone who knew of George and Shannon's true relationship would understand the full meaning of those words. Can we stop this sad music now? I see. Thank you, father. George stood up. The traces of tears still streaked his face, but his expression had returned to its usual calm one. Let's go, Batlakun, Jessica Chan. If we stay here any longer, we'll get in the way of the adults. Sniff. You're right. Jessica sniffled once, showing her face to her mother, who had been holding her the whole time, to let her know she was okay now. Wait, wasn't Maria's mother in there? Oh, that's not going to go down well. When she faced George again, she once again had on her usual expression. 
although she still couldn't smile. Battler, hang in there. So many orphans in one night. Battler kept on crouching in front of his parents' bodies. I'm sorry. Crying like hell calmed me down. You bastard, Dad. I bet you're laughing at me. After all that shit I talked about you, here I am crying like a baby just because you died. Well, so what? I guess I just got the gene that makes you cry when your parents kick the bucket. Batler's face was still bright red from the tears. But he had at least recovered enough to fake a smile, if only a bitter one. Canon, you mustn't remain here any longer either. Take the children and return to the mansion. Natsuhi had been standing under the rain this whole time, unable to take a step into the storehouse. Maybe she had her own way of grieving, different from Battler's. She's probably happy, realising that she had to take on a role of responsibility now that her husband was dead. She gave Canon those orders. Wait, Rosa, Kraus and Rudolf are all dead. Eva is the last one standing. Yes, madam. Canon rose silently and turned to face me. His face was pure white, all, almost as though his own heart had died along with Shannon. And there was no life in his expression, <laughs> so his default state. On an ordinary day, if he had been told to guide the children through the beautiful rose garden, Canon might have led the way. But now, there was no distinction between Canon and the children. They were now just kids of about the same age, suffering the pain of losing those close to them. And he faded away. After making sure that the children were leaving, Natsuhi started giving orders to Genji. Genji, contact the police immediately. They probably won't be able to come until the typhoon passes, but they should be able to tell us what to do next. Understood. There is an emergency radio, so I will use that to contact them. When she heard that, Natsuhi remembered. That's right, the phones were out today, weren't they? However, they also had a radio, since they couldn't necessarily rely on phones all the time while living on an isolated island. At any rate, they should start by contacting the police and receiving their instructions. Everything else could wait. Dr. Nanjo, is there anything more you can do here? <laughs> I don't think he can help anymore. Unfortunately, there is nothing I can do. Understood. Genji, could you at least cover their faces with something? Exposing them like this is humiliating to them as well. Yes, ma'am. Genji picked up several dried up towels from inside the storehouse, when Eva stopped him with a shrill voice. Wait a second! Stop! This is the scene of a crime, isn't it? Then we mustn't disturb it. We all panicked and walked in here with our shoes on, but even that will surely get in the way of the police's investigation, right? Indeed. Natsuhi glared at Eva, offended. Objectively speaking, Eva was right. Even so, she glared at Eva as though accusing her of refusing to do those tragic corpses. Which had... wait, what? Even though she glared... even though, comma, she glared at Eva as though accusing her of refusing to do those tragic corpses. Am I the only one who's not understanding this sentence? Which had been humiliated even after death? Ah, oh, okay. Yeah. That is a weirdly... That is a weird sentence. The simple kindness of covering their faces. That was a weird place to stop it. It was like... that. Did, moving on. However, Eva had spoken both calmly and correctly. This horrible situation definitely wasn't an accident. It was a crime. Someone had killed them. It was a murder case. So they needed to be careful to avoid disturbing the site any further. They had to do what little they could to aid the police, 
preserving clues that might help catch the detestable culprit. <laughs> and now Nanjo's asleep. I agree with Eva-san. Until the police come, we should leave everything be. What do you say, madam? You're right. Very well. Close it up. And just in case, we should put a different lock on it. A different lock? Yes. When we came here, the shutter was locked. That means the culprit used the key to the shutter to lock it. Th that makes sense. So, does that mean the key that opens this shutter will have the culprit's fingerprints on it? I'm sure it'll be worth submitting it to the police as evidence. But Kanon-kun usually has it, and he used it to unlock the shed just now. It'll probably have Kanon's fingerprints on it. It was Kanon! I knew it! Also, that key was handed to Genji-san just now, and he took it with his bare hands. <gasps> Genji-san is the accomplice. It doesn't look like it'll be very useful as evidence. That was careless of me. My apologies. Genji-san, are there any other keys to this storehouse? No, only this one. So the culprit walked out of the servant room with that key, and then was nice enough to return the key to where they found it. <laughs> we have a little diagram. Hideyoshi's theory sounded plausible, but it was actually very strange if you thought about it. Not really. Why would they go to all the trouble of returning a key they stole? Why wouldn't you? No, if you think about it even more deeply, there are some points that are even more bizarre. When a criminal hides a body, they're usually trying to delay the point at which it'll be found so they can use that time to escape. The six weren't necessarily killed here, but it was reasonable to assume that they were killed somewhere on this island, Yenoshit, carried to this storehouse, and hidden to delay the discovery of the crime. And yet, the eerie magic circle scribbled on the storehouse shutter had eloquently indicated the location of the hidden corpses. Maybe they wanted them to be found. Did you ever consider that? Sure, it didn't explicitly mention the corpses, but six people had gone missing. In that situation, someone had made such an obvious piece of graffiti and even returned the key to the shutter. Almost as though they wanted the corpses here to be discovered. Hmm, I wonder. Anyway, we can't put all our faith in a lock that the culprit has opened once before. If we want to protect this place from the culprit's hand, I think we should put a new lock on it. I think that's a good plan. I agree. Genji fished around inside the storehouse and unsealed a brand new padlock that had been inside a small box. What should I do with the key? I will take it. I will take responsibility and hand it over to the police. Not if you die first! Natsuhi took the key and the pad took the key to the padlock from Genji's hand. After that, they all exited and lowered the shutter. And so, the corpses were once again sealed behind that shutter, which was still covered with that creepy magic circle. Genji crouched down in front of the shutter to fasten the new padlock. Shutters often have a place in front where you can attach your own lock in addition to the main lock of the shutter. Take a shot every time. Shutter. This was one of those types. In the midst of the roar of thunder and the pouring rain, the storehouse stood there, ominously. With its closed shutter, still covered in a blood-like creepy substance, it swallowed up the bodies of the six. To Natsuhi, putting the new lock on it, putting the new lock on wasn't mainly to preserve the scene for the police. She might have felt like she wanted to shut that mouth for all eternity. Oh my. To prevent that eerie beast from swallowing up any more victims. Come on, let's go everyone. Dr. Nanjo, thank you very much for your work. Genji, hurry and contact the police. I will do so as soon as I return. The adults left the storehouse. The ghastly magic circle drawn on the shutter kept the six bodies in its throat, looming eerily as the lightning occasionally lit it up. It's the gateway to Silent Hill! Ooh! Smashing! It's... ooh! 
quarter to nine. Okay, that's a odd time. Cool. All that could be heard was the sound of the rain, the voices from the kids' TV program Maria was watching, and the engrossed Maria's cackling voice. In other words, what greeted them as they returned, dumbfounded from that horrible, bizarre scene, was the voice of Maria as she rolled around laughing at the TV. Oh, you just said that. Stop repeating things. Those who returned to the room didn't know how to explain to Maria that her mother was dead and were trapped by a suffocating silence. That's okay, everybody's mother is dead. At first, Maria returned to their stares with a dubious look. But when she realized they weren't trying to blame her for anything, she ignored them and again immersed herself in the TV program. Ah, to be nine again. The children wordlessly sat down heavily on the sofa. So many adjectives. Their minds were probably blank from their state of shock. Everyone had already cried and mourned so much, but now they just vaguely sat there, their faces seeming to have lost all emotion. Only Canon had returned to his usual calm expression. However, that probably didn't mean he'd been able to wipe out the shock. Nothing was reflected in his eyes as he stared into empty space, so his default state. Hideyoshi kept on fidgeting, and every time he remembered that horrible scene, he started muttering about how he couldn't believe it, how it couldn't have been something from this world, how it must have been the work of demons. Every now and then, his mutterings produced a question directed at Nanjo. But the latter kept repeating in a calm, doctor-like manner that nothing could be understood by only glancing at the scene, and that until the police arrived, they wouldn't learn anything. Still having a stroke. However, Nanjo only appeared calm next to Hideyoshi, who simply couldn't suppress his agitation and fear. In fact, Nanjo had also received a huge shock, and his face was a deathly pale. Yeah, he's in the midst of a heart attack. Maybe that atmosphere was why she tried to rise to the challenge and take charge. Natsuhi, your time to shine. Natsuhi appeared to be unchanged from her normal attitude. Headache. And she briskly gave directions. I will go see father. Genji, quickly contact the police. Certainly. I wonder if you would allow me to tag along, Natsuhi Nesan. Since Kraus Nisan is now gone, the task of aiding father has been left to me. It would be improper of me to relax here while rely relying entirely on you. Natsuhi was struck speechless by Eva's aggressive move in a situation like this. She seemed to be claiming that with Kraus dead, the one to take responsibility shouldn't be his wife, but herself, the next highly ranked in the family. Or maybe she hadn't been at all happy when Natsuhi took command without reference to her in such an extreme situation. However, even Eva's mind had been blank from shock until a moment ago. She only came to her senses after Natsuhi started giving orders. Just do as you like. Dang. Natsuhi started walking without saying a word more. Eva followed behind her. Oh, Kumasawa-san. As they did, Kumasawa ran into the parlor. She usually wasn't the kind of person to run around, so under normal circumstances, most people would have taken her entrance as a sign that something was the matter. But because everyone was still stricken with shock, they hardly even noticed her. Um, madam? Madam? If you're looking for Natsuhi Nesan, she went to see father. She'll probably be back soon. What happened, Kumasawa-san? You see, in the dining hall, there was blood, blood. The ears of everyone in the parlor twitched. Everyone thought the same thing. I hope I misheard that. Any container can only hold so much, and no one here would be capable of handling yet another tragedy. Is there anyone even left that isn't dead yet? So they all fought it. I hope I misheard that. You just said that. What happened in the dining hall? When I went to the dining hall to set up for breakfast, oh, whoa, 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 whoa. what? The first one to start running was George. His harsh footsteps jogged Hideyoshi and Nanjo to their senses, and they chased after him. Battler and the others followed. 
They flew into the dining hall one after another, but they didn't find any change that might have caused Kumasawa to go pale. To those who had viewed that gruesome scene in the storehouse, it was a bit of an anticlimax. However, Kumasawa, who had followed them, pointed it out. There really were some traces of blood remaining on the floor. Compared to that terrible scene, it wasn't very impressive. However, if you calmly thought about it, this definitely indicated the loss of a lot of blood. There's another puddle of blood over here. What in the world? It appears that a great deal of time has passed. It's probably safe to say they were killed here last night. It definitely looks that way. We were talking together in the dining hall until late into the night. After that, someone must have forced their way in. Dad, when did you and Mum slip out of the meeting and go to sleep? Hmm, it was a little past midnight. So we should probably assume it happened after that, you yeah, know shit. Are you kidding me? Give me a break. Milady, please stay strong. Milady, <laughs> After seeing that hell on earth in the storehouse, this is nothing. Really? Good for you. I feel like my head's gonna explode. This is the dining hall, right? Every day, this is where I'd eat, complain about school, complain about homework, talk to my dad about my grades. That's what this place is to me. Milady? It wouldn't be good to remain here any longer. Let's return to the parlor. I agree. Uncle Hideyoshi, I think this room will be really important to the police. Don't you think it'd be bad if we trampled all over it? Battler proposed this in a slightly firm voice as, along with Kanon, he grabbed the pale and shaking Jessica's shoulders. <laughs> and he's asleep again. Everything is just as Batlasan has said. There is nothing more to be gained from remaining in this room. Nanjo spoke while looking at everyone's pale faces. How's he looking through his closed eyes? Even though that horrible scene in the storehouse felt like something not of this world, at least then we'd, we'd been able to leave, to cut ourselves off from that place and run away. Everyone had shared in that feeling. However, this dining hall was different. It was in the mansion, the main building on this estate. And as Jessica had said, it should have been one of the main calming places even inside the mansion. It was where all of the relatives had eaten lunch and dinner yesterday. The shock of seeing this place smeared with blood reminded us of that horrible spectacle in the storehouse, and forced us to accept that we hadn't really been able to run away from the scene of that tragedy. Hmm. I agree too. The culprit might have left traces in this room. Amateurs like us shouldn't stir the place up. Let's leave quickly. Quickly, quickly! Hideyoshi also understood the meaning of what Batla had said, and pushed everyone to hurry out of the dining room. The way we were then, looking at that blood any longer would have been too harsh. I just noticed he has a pink tie. I like it. Nobody went against his words. Everyone raced each other out of the dining hall. It was almost as though the last person in the room would be trapped in there, all alone. Alright, actually, I'm gonna end this episode here. Now, that was a, an intense hour two episodes. I need a break. <laughs> All right. We will continue and I guess tell Maria that she's now an orphan in the next one. See you there.